I have to say, when I emailed you to say, what have you picked? You mm. picked one of my all time favorites. Oh so my this God, is really? a good one. So go on, tell everyone what you picked. I have picked uh, the St. Crispin's Day, or St. Crispian, depends how you pronounce it, St. Oh, Crispian's yeah. Day uh, speech from Henry V. Was it your audition speech? It was, yeah. Oh. It was. It was my Shakespearean audition speech for all the drama schools. And yeah. I remember doing the speech in conjunction with like a weird hodgepodge of other things. I did it with a very sort of posh piece of George, George Bernard Shaw that my dad sort of forced me into doing because <laughs> he thought it was proper writing. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I did a piece of Glengarry Glen Ross, which oh, I was, brilliant. I mean, couldn't be more wrong for. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I wandered into the audition room, you know, wearing chinos and moccasins and a sort of, you know, I mean, looking ridiculous. I mean, frankly, a person who'd never lived any life beyond you know, <laughs> the privileges of public school is pathetic. And I and I came in and did this kind of like, you know, a impression of Alec Baldwin. It was, it was stupid. And I remember one of the panelists was mm. Daniel Evans. And at the oh. end of I'd done all of it, who a, a, an actor and director and yeah. now artistic director. Artistic I, director, yeah. Yeah, I admire hugely. And he looked up at me and said, that was the most preposterous audition I've ever seen. I've always sort of wanted to maybe just once be on the other side of the table, just to see what, what, what it is about, you know, someone doing the piece again in pretending oh to be God. a piece of spaghetti actually makes I... you go, oh yeah, no, this person really got it, you know? The director and teacher in my recall told me to do something like cling film. Yeah. And... I walked along doing this with my hands because I think in my mind I was like cling film sticks to itself right so I was like you know but obviously I sort of looked a bit like a crab I don't know and at the end he was like the fuck was that like, and I was like cling film sticks to itself and I think in a certain way there's a bullying culture there's a bit of a how much can you take how much can yeah. you take and keep going it, which is you know there's so much of our profession is 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 in that resilience that you know you do need and if you can get through the kind of feeling of terrible shame and like you've done something awfully oh. wrong and but then come back at it and try it and do it like a piece of cling film um <laughs> you maybe maybe you've got what it you're what made it for life in the theatre I think the fact that Crispin's Day is such a great speech is even more amazing when you consider the other speeches within yeah. that play that yeah, are yeah. insanely great. So why do you love this one so much? Why do I love this one so much? Well, I just, I suppose it goes back to, to, to loving the, the character, the part, and why it's a part I so want to play is you've seen in the preceding play Henry the Fourth, well one and two mm. the an extraordinary character arc of this guy who's a sort of layabout you know yeah. loutish kind of prince who hasn't really got any prospects but somewhere you sense and you begin to feel their hidden depths and then over the course of the next two plays the, those depths are revealed to be a kind of ocean of resourcefulness, of courage, of manipulation, of real elan. And it, and it reminds me, I think by the time you get to Crispin's day, he reminds me of someone who I've kind of admired. I mean, again, a completely different political context, but a very similar kind of charisma hmm. um, is Fidel Castro. I've always Ooh. loved Cuba. I've always, the history of Cuba, I've longed to go there. I've been, tried to go there many times and uh, for whatever reason work, usually I've not been able to go. Yeah. But I've watched a lot of documentaries on him and seen lots of pictures of him in the way when he was talking to people. And he has in Crispin's day, qualities that are embodied by those great stars of the world, um, mm. you know, that make you go, I would follow you to the ends of the earth. One of my favourite lines of all Shakespeare is the moment when they ask the French army if they can have a bit of a reprieve because their soldiers are tired and ill. And there's almost that very like that weird nobility of war, which is surely you'll let us have a break because it's not a fair battle whilst we're starving. And the French basically go, no, fight us tomorrow, you know, or you can give up if you want to give up. And Henry has a line, and I'm going to totally bastardise it here probably, but he says something like, we, we would not wish a battle as we are, but as we are, we will not shun it. Mm -hmm. It's basically like, 
fuck you. <laughs> it's a great maxim for a lot of life, isn't it? You know, it, whether yeah. it be, you know, the most mundane of tasks or big life decisions, you know, so often you're not ready for them, but mm. you just have to do it. As someone who loves it so much, what's your favorite that you've seen? Well, I don't think I've ever actually seen a bad one mm. um, because I think I've only seen three. And I've only seen they? one production on stage, mm. um, which was the Michael Boyd Grant Magnum Opus of uh, the uh, the Roundhouse, you know, where he did all of them. And actually, I was really thrilled and entertained by it. I saw the Jude Law one, and I thought Jude Law was great. I remember him saying, actually, in an interview, I think, when he was doing it, which I read, that he said, we do, in our society today... I think either lack heroes or that we tear them down mm. so fast before they've had a chance to, to, to really blossom. That he said, I, I feel like it was a play that I wanted to do because I wanted to see a hero on stage. And, you know, the joy of it now is Henry V could be a hero played by anybody of any gender. Mm, and, mm, and, mm. and it still holds as being um, a, a hero and will always echo the new heroes that we have coming through society today. I played Catherine. I have played. Oh, you, that's a great part. Yeah. I mean, it's, I it's, it's, as in she's the, always talking French. Yeah, she's French. Yeah. The French queen. I still yeah, have princess. a friend of mine, a university friend, who whenever I see her father, he goes, the Bilbo, which sounds a lot like the dildo. But I think he's <laughs> referring to, I don't think we have a history of anything to do with the dildo together. Um, but yeah, he's just referring to me friend. saying, the Elbow, away from Henry. But what is your favourite Shakespeare part that you have been able to do? Oh, well... That's a very leading question. It's there. not. I as <laughs> I said, <laughs> as I said it, I thought I don't mean. So Freddie was in a version of A Midsummer Night's Dream that I produced some years ago. I mean that experience of that play was amazing, and mm. I and you know it, I will treasure that actually. Mm. That, that and and I was thinking of it today, just on a walk on in the park. I think probably though, it generally, I think because of the history that I've had with Romeo and Juliet by doing mm. it uh, twice and the second time doing it under such strange circumstances. Of course, circumstances, please explain, please explain. I uh, played Romeo in Romeo and Juliet at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield in 2015. Yeah. And had a wonderful time doing that. And anyway, I, I sort of put it to bed and it was done and it was a happy memory and then, um, my agent called me one day, I was down in Dorset and my dear friend, Lily James, who I've known yeah. since we were at drama school, we, you know, yeah. we, we arrived in the same year, um, was playing it for Kenneth Branagh and my phone rings mm. and I'm like, oh, what's that? And it's my agent saying, listen, Richard Madden, who was playing Romeo has yeah. had a, a, an injury to his ankle, which, you know, was really sad and tough for him. And he, had to pull out of the show and the understudy too, another lovely actor called Tom Hansen, he had to pull out because he'd done his knee in a fight sequence when he was understudying and this, and Hank Aaron said, is there any way you remember the lines? And you were like, I'm on a train already. <laughs> well, kind of, but I was like, do I remember this? It was a year ago that I did the play. How quickly between the phone call and the performance was it? Did you literally have to go on that night? But I had about 48, just over 48 hours. And then I went in and did the day's rehearsal and the plot of the whole thing and the new fight sequences and, there were some cuts in my version that were different to their version. So you had to cut it around. And then we were on the following night. So it was about sort of from the, the day I heard about it to the day of doing it, it was about three days. And it was, I mean, singularly the most frightening experience. Oh, I love but that. Also shit. the most wonderfully. Yeah. Rewarding. I love that kind of stuff in theatre. I have to say, I actually get real kicks during previews because not quite as stressful as your situation jumping in in the middle of it. But I really get a buzz from that. Okay, tonight you've got to implement these changes and you get to a point where sometimes you're walking on stage and your brain's going, something is different in this scene. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what it is, but I remember that at some point in the scene, I'm meant to do something different. And you just have to pray <laughs> that when you get to that line or that moment that your body kicks in and goes, that's it. This is the thing you're and, meant to do, and it does normally weirdly. Yeah. Like I know you're like I. I remember giving being given something like sixty notes before a, a preview <laughs> of the Judas Kiss, and I almost I, I I got in a strop with the director. I got in a real strop. I was like, how am I supposed to remember sixty notes? And he said, just it's okay. You don't need to get them all, but you'll 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 remember them. And I was yeah. like, I won't. I can't even remember how to walk now. <laughs> and you get on stage, and then something happens. Something yeah. you know, you the fear or whatever just makes you go, and you're super focused and. Yeah. And you go, oh God, when I was doing the Judas Kiss, people shout from the back of the stall, speak up, speak up. That's horrific. 
<laughs> That's so funny you say that because I interview Claire Skinner on the show earlier mm. and um, she has a real, she talks about how she's got a real insecurity now because basically when she did Moonlight, which is the play that she chooses to speak about in her episode, yeah. there was a moment when someone from the audience shouted at her to speak up. When someone shouts at you from the stalls, you never forget it. You really don't. The play was with Rupert Everett and I remember coming oh, up going, oh, so I'm so terrible, I'm just, I've ruined it, the scene, I'm so sorry. And he was like, oh, shut up, stop <laughs> being so wet. I This happened to me all the time when I was doing The Vortex. I was I played Nicky in The Vortex every night. It was, speak up, Nicky, speak up. And so one day when someone wrote to him saying, mm. you probably know this story, it's such no. an old, you know, like. I haven't heard this. Someone wrote to him saying, Dear Mr. Everett, my wife and I enjoyed the play very much, but certainly the only thing that was lacking was the fact that we couldn't hear the character of Nicky. Ergo, it was an otherwise perfect evening sullied by bad diction. Rupert cut off a, a, a lock of his pubic hair, put it into an envelope, wrote another <laughs> letter back saying, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Um, for ruining your evening. As a token of my apology, here is a lock of my pubic hair. <laughs> I said it. I mean, that I, after he told me that story, I thought, okay, I feel better now. He's maybe not. <laughs> You're like, but I won't be repeating that because I don't have their address. I haven't got enough pubic hair to spare, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>